Uh, the purpose of this meeting of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future is twofold. Our first two presentations will cover reviews being conducted by the federal government in response to the natural disaster and resulting nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan. Please note that the purpose of today's presentations is not to get into the myriad details of what happened and why. The staff has prepared a background memo on the details of the event. Uh, that memo was provided to all commissioners and is posted on the commission's website. The purpose of today's briefings is to hear from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the United States Department of Energy about what steps are being taken to review the safety of domestic nuclear facilities in light of the events in Japan. After those presentations, we will then ask the co-chairman of the Commission's three subcommittees to deliver presentations to describe the recommendations that are emerging from their work. We will discuss our plans for the subcommittee reports and the draft report of the full Commission later today. As always, we will end our meeting by hearing from any member of the audience who wishes to speak up. A sign-up sheet for the public comment period is available now. It will close at 2 p.m. We've allowed an hour for public comment, and we look forward to hearing what people have to say. Speakers will be limited. Of course, that will depend on the number of speakers and the amount of time that we have. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about the tragedy that has struck our friends in Japan. Commissioner Ayers, uh, McFarlane, Peterson, and General Scowcroft visited Japan in February, just a few weeks before the earthquake and the tsunami struck. They were, they have told us, deeply impressed by the hospitality of our Japanese hosts and by the time and effort they devoted to our visit. We know that many of the same people who were so generous with their time during that visit are now struggling to get the situation under control and to minimize the public health impacts of the accident. Our hearts go out to them, to those who perished in the earthquake and tsunami, and to those whose lives have been forever changed by that disaster. I open the floor for just a moment to see if any of the commissioners would like to further comment. If not, we will proceed with the speakers of the morning. Our first speaker will be Lawrence Kukayako, the Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'd ask him to take the uh, podium if he would. As many of you know, the chairman of the NRC has directed that a review be conducted of the safety, excuse me, conducted of the safety of U.S. commercial nuclear facilities in light of the events at the nuclear power station in Japan. We recognize that the review is still ongoing and the complete results of the review will not be available until this summer, but we have asked the NRC to share what information they can today, particularly as it relates to the storage of spent nuclear fuel. Mr. Kakako, thank you for joining us and you may proceed. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Lawrence Kakaiko. I'm the Acting uh, Deputy Director for the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The reason I'm acting is because Dan Dorman, who is the Deputy Director for the Office, uh, is on the Japanese uh, Response Task Force and uh, could not be here today. Also, my real job is I'm the Division Director for the Division of High-Level Waste Repository Safety in that same office. And you'll have to forgive uh, my edit typo here, but um, we all know that uh, the uh, tragic events in Japan uh, was one of the largest ever recorded off the eastern coast of that country. And uh, the power plants did shut down as they were designed to do. And uh, Unit 4, of course, was defueled at the time uh, with all the fuel in the spent fuel pool. The plant uh, diesel generators did come on and uh, then it was inundated uh, by a tsunami which disrupted all power to the facility and uh, as the BRC 
staff memorandum to the BRC Commission points out um, the batteries eventually died and of course uh, the event took a much more serious tone. We are missing many important pieces of information about the event of what quite happened at the facility and as the situation continues to stabilize and the, the emergency response phase begins to wind down, we expect more time and attention can be shifted toward obtaining the miss missing information. And I know there are many questions here today regarding the performance of the facility itself, including the spent fuel pools at Fukushima Daiichi. Until we have a more complete understanding of the event sequences and specific systems responses, many of the questions must remain unanswered for now. Although many important details are missing, there is enough information uh, about the event to warrant specific actions by the NRC. Uh, on March 11th, uh, the NRC began a monitoring phase of the emerging events uh, in Japan. And that monitoring is continuing to this day. Uh, this uh, group in the operations centers does provide advice to the U.S. government, including the U.S. Embassy in Japan. Uh, we also provide advice to the government of Japan, and we have NRC experts not only here in headquarters, but also on the ground in uh, Japan uh, on, uh, who are experts in reactor systems as well as protective measures. And they are assisting, uh, again, the Japanese government and as well as other stakeholders such as the IAEA. On March 18th, we did uh, issue an information notice and uh, provided uh, this information was essentially provided a high-level discussion of the earthquake as we knew it at the time, and uh, it was essentially a allowed the licensees to have the benefit of our information so that they could uh, consider it for other actions that they may need to take themselves. We also uh, provided in that information uh, notice a discussion of the pertinent regulatory requirements such as station blackout, as well as uh, what we call B5B, which is advanced accident mitigation. For our inspector staff, and we do have inspectors on site, we issued two temporary instructions. Uh, the inspectors were required to look at, independently, uh, look at and independently assess the adequacy of the actions taken by the licensee, inspect capabilities to mitigate uh, conditions beyond design basis, as well as uh, do additional fact and data gathering in case we need to take future regulatory actions. The second temporary instruction did ask to the inspectors to determine uh, if the severe accident mitigation guidelines were available and how are they being maintained, and then determine the nature and the extent of the licensee implementation of those guidelines in training as well as in exercises. But more significantly, two days ago, we issued NRC Bulletin 2011-01. And bulletins at the NRC address significant issues requiring great urgency and usually require action or responses by the licensee. And this is the first bulletin that the NRC has issued since 2007. The events in Japan highlight the importance and potential versatility of mitigating strategies for potential loss of large areas of the plant due to explosions or fires. Therefore, the NRC sought comprehensive confirmation that the licensees are maintaining equipment and strategies to satisfy the regulatory requirements to maintain and restore cooling to the core containment or spent fuel pools due to explosions or fires. In this bulletin, we are requiring that within 30 days, information to verify that the equipment necessary to execute in the mitigating strategies are available and capable of performing their intended function as well as that the operating staff is appropriately trained and available to implement the mitigation strategies in the current configuration of the facility. Separately, we are requiring within 60 days that the licensees must respond to a specific set of questions. These questions concern the maintenance, testing, and availability of equipment relied on for mitigation, updates of guidance on mitigation strategies, as well as the availability of off-site support. Based upon the information that is provided, the NRC may determine additional efforts are needed to ensure compliance with existing regulatory requirements and whether enhancements to the regulatory framework is necessary. On March 23rd, the Commission uh, authorized a, an establishment of a senior level task force to review the available information on the events in Japan. 
This task force will conduct a methodical and systematic review of the regulatory requirements, programs, processes, and their implementation. They will determine if the NRC should make additional improvements to its regulatory system and provide recommendations to the Commission for policy direction and implementation. The task force will recommend near-term actions as well as identify a framework and topics for longer-term review. The NRC task force has been charged with several specific things that are outlined in its charter. They will independently study the events at Fukushima, identify relevant and important topics for application to the U.S. reactors, including spent fuel pools, consult with agency experts, interact with domestic and international stakeholders, identify a framework and topics for review and assessment of the longer-term effort, and formulate these recommendations and provide it to the Commission, to the NRC, uh, in a report that is due in July 2011. And yesterday, Dr. Charles Miller is the task force leader presented its initial briefing to the Commission in a public meeting, and that uh, material will be uh, available for public review. The review approach will focus on Fukushima exclusively and all those issues that are known to date, and it will include insights from past lesson learned efforts such as Three Mile Island. They will take a defense in depth approach looking at the prevention, mitigation, and emergency preparedness of the facility, and it will look at protection from natural phenomenon, including design basis natural events and consideration of beyond design basis natural events. They will look at the mitigation of the long-term station blackout, including single or multiple unit failures and events, emergency preparedness, and the implications for our programs. And one of the goals is to assure that any new requirement uh, that is, comes out of this review is done in an organized and thoughtful way. One of the focus areas of the task force is the methods used to evaluate protection from natural occurring hazardous phenomenon. In doing so, they will assess the design basis derived from the likely and unlikely events, as well as those appropriate safety margins evaluated for plant performance for beyond design basis events. They will also include uh, an evaluation of external challenges that could lead to station blackout, including seismic activity, tsunamis, uh, storm surges, uh, upstream dam failures, as well as precipitation and internal flooding. They will consider related and sequential external events such as an earthquake and tsunamis. In particular, the task force is asked to examine the sur survivability of emergency AC power for those things that are beyond design events, as well as include the evaluation of alternate sources of AC power for safety equipment in case the normal sources are lost. The task force will also review steps that can be taken to mitigate the effects of long-term station blackout, such as strategies to prevent the core damage to the core or spent fuel or spent fuel pools and prevent the releases of radionuclides, as well as look at the procedures and training for making appropriate emergency response personnel available and to ensure that their response is effective and protective. Although much of the task force will focus on primary reactor systems, the performance of the spent fuel pools will also be evaluated, and it will consider additional strategies to prevent the damage to the fuel located in the pools, and these uh, strategies could include assessing heat removal capability, such as water and air cooling, enhancing, enhancing air coolability by relocating spent fuel, and assessing instrumentation availability. Mitigation strategies use a combination of procedures, some of which are voluntary by the industry. They will consider whether additional integration among these procedures is necessary and would enhance the training and increase the capability to implement overall mitigation. This will require review of the emergency operating procedures, which are required, severe accident mitigation guidelines, and extensive damage mitigation guidelines. In addition to the prevention of damage to the fuel in the pool, they will also consider strategies to mitigate the releases from potentially damaged fuel in the spent fuel pools. These could include filtration, monitoring, and scrubbing of potential releases, hydrogen control measures, pressure control and secondary containments in spent fuel pool buildings, and instrumentation availability. 
Similarly, as I noted before, the procedures will be assessed as well. And one final uh, point about the task force, they have also been asked to look at cross-cutting issues that uh, may be relevant, such as emergency planning, incident decision making, command and control, radiation monitoring during the event, and the prophylactic use of potassium iodide. The current assessment, and this was provided to our commission yesterday uh, in its 30-day update, was that based upon the initial review of the available information, the task force has not yet identified any issues that undermine our confidence in the continued safety and emergency planning of the U.S. commercial nuclear power plant fleet. The task force review is likely to make recommendations to enhance safety and preparedness, but we will not know the outcome of that until later uh, this year. The task force has several next steps. If there is any information, of course, that uh, derives from the review of the Fukushima uh, Daiichi event, which indicates a concern with existing safety requirements, the NRC has a full range of regulatory options to require licensees to make immediate changes to existing procedures or systems. They'll continue its review and consider their implication for the U.S. We will continue to evaluate the results from the instructions that we've given to our inspectors. Uh, a 60-day update is uh, due on June 16th, and a final task force briefing is scheduled currently for July 19th of this year. And the report will be made public in July, uh, after, probably after the briefing. Uh, the task force in its report will identify those actions that the NRC must undertake for long term effort to better understand the implications and the lessons from the uh, Japanese earthquake and tsunami. I'd like to close my presentation and uh, ask for questions. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from commissioners at this point? Uh, Phil? Uh, thank you very much for your report. Um, my question is about the dry cast storage. We've seen in the media very little about uh, what was on site there, and my presumption is that so far we're unaware of any real damage to it, but I guess uh, I would like to, I think we should know, and especially before we come out with our report, whether there are any damage to the cask, whether they sustained the hit by the water as well as the, uh, the um, thing, and, and what, what do we know about them? I'm sure that was not the first order of business, uh, given the nature of the accident. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my understanding that the, there was dry cast on site, I don't recall the number, but I understand it's about 400 or so fuel assemblies are in dry cast storage. Um, they have uh, the, a location of where their dry, vertical dry cast were was further back from the shore and elevated higher. Uh, they were, I understand, impacted by the tsunami, but uh, they were not uh, impacted. I don't even think they were knocked over. They may have been moved, but I don't think they were knocked over. Um, that's about all I know about that at this time, but that is something that we clearly have an interest in, and uh, we are very interested in the robustness of their uh, dry cast storage systems. Well, I, if I just present a little more, it, it would be very useful, I think, for our report, since we are likely to conclude, like has widespread conclusion about the high safety value of dry cast storage and uh, to know whether or not there really was any discernible damage. So whether somebody's really going to go in there and inspect those carefully, I don't know what that would take, but I just hope that that is on the agenda of, uh, for the Japanese in particular, but for us as well. Uh, we, we clearly are, have an interest in that, and we have identified that as an area we're interested in exploring further. Um, where it exists on the priority s scheme for Japan, sure. uh, I think, is a little lower. I can imagine. Okay. Uh, Richard. Thank you. It's, uh, you obviously have a large number of things underway. I have uh, two questions for you. One is uh, uh, you did emphasize that the issuance of a bulletin is a rather unusual event, not unprecedented, but you haven't done one for several years. Um, and I'm curious whether you could say something whether the pressure or reason for issuance of the bulletin was a result of your early inspections uh, and uh, what you had discovered as to the adequacy of the state of the equipment to deal with severe accidents. 
I don't know all the uh, information input that went into that, but it's my, my understanding that some of the initial inspections did lead to this, as well as the, um, the, uh, the, the, the INPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations and NEI, uh, assessing internally what uh, may have transpired, and they thought it was, um, you know, provided that input to us. The information bulletin, which went out almost you know, relatively quickly also alerted the licensees that they needed to take a look at this. And the TIs, I think, the results that some of the TIs did uh, give us a, a view that we felt we needed to ask for this information. And we, as you know, the 30-day and 60-day response is a pretty quick response, and other things could grow out from those, those reports. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what the NRC understands the situation is at Unit 4. Uh, at the Fukushima plant, that there were early reports of a complete drain down event and possibility of very major fuel damage. Uh, and subsequent reports has been that they've taken some samples, as I understand it, from the uh, water that's in the pool, and it doesn't reflect as extensive damage as one would have expected if that event had occurred. Um, I'm quite curious as to whether there are any lessons about risks from spent fuel pools that you're uh, well, for interested in the status and whether there's anything you can say about the accident progression and particularly the spent fuel pool. I don't have a lot of information about that. I will say that I have a lifeline here today with me and I will um, <laughs> and uh, turn it. Jennifer, do you have a, uh, information on Unit 4? You never go anywhere without a lifeline because Jennifer used to work for me in my office. <laughs> she was my lifeline then, too. Yes. Uh, uh, we have, there had been uh, differing understandings along the way about Unit 4 spent fuel pool. As you were saying, uh, occasionally they, people were surmising. And again, I want to say this is all presumption because uh, there's going to be a lot that's going to be learned as the Japanese uh, further pursue uh, the recovery and then the final uh, dispositioning of the site. Uh, there were uh, some concerns that there was a, a partial, if not full, drain down. Uh, that, uh, there were obviously some, if, if anyone has seen photos that have been publicly available, there were uh, some emissions, I would say. Was it smoke, was it steam uh, coming from the building that wasn't quite clear. Uh, so at this point, I think the Japanese, if you do go online, the Japanese are concluding that there uh, was no fuel damage and uh, that if some of the fuel were damaged, it would have been because of mechanical damage, perhaps uh, something falling into the pool. Uh, but again, this is all conjecture at this point until we can actually, or the Japanese, can get into the pools and verify for themselves, although they have tried to use uh, imaging uh, by putting in a camera. And at this point, uh, the images online are showing that the pool is completely filled at this point and the rods look intact. So I don't think that answers your question because we don't really have the final answer. I, I think it is very important for us to understand the progression of the events yeah. in Unit yeah. 4, because yeah. that does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, the, we have um, analyzed uh, events in the spent fuel pool. We've uh, probably done about six or seven studies on spent fuel pools over the years. Uh, most recently, the, the study that was done for the uh, aircraft impact analysis after 9-11 that was completed in 2004, National Academies uh, followed up with a report on that. And so we do, uh, NRC does have a, a very good understanding of a progression in a drain down event. Now the probability of inducing that drain down where the site, where the whole of uh, the penetration may be fail, where that location is, how large that is, is um, obviously something that has to be analyzed in terms of a probability. So there's uncertainty there. But given a certain flow rate out of the pool, for whatever reason, we have um, a very high confidence in our technical ability to analyze the event. It, it's based uh, in part on some zirconium fire studies that were done at the Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, we had done that for BWR 
assemblies, and uh, we're following it up with PWR assemblies right now and validated our, our codes to ensure that we can predict uh, the heat transfer and then uh, under certain circumstances, uh, zirconium fire and propagation. But that's only the, the that zirconium fire propagation only occurs under uh, certain conditions. Okay, the chair has a pair and then Allison, Ernie, did you, and Ernie, and then Jonathan, a pair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, my questions, uh, I, I want to pull on a couple of, of technical threads. Before doing that, uh, it's, I think, useful to note that, that this commission is comprised to be a policy commission, not a technical commission. So we're interested in, in learning about the, the uh, technical details of what happened, but, but the, the policy dimensions are also important. I'd just like to note that uh, in, in, as these events have unfolded, the value of having an independent and scientifically technical, scientifically and technically capable regulatory agency available to monitor this accident, provide advice to us and to the Japanese, I think should be emphasized because indeed what the NRC has been doing this last two months has been very positive in terms of reducing, mitigating the consequences to Japan and also giving us the opportunity to lesson, learn, le learn lessons here. So the, a couple of the technical dimensions that I'd like to dig into just a little bit more relate to the nature of this accident. The Three Mile Island accident was one that was internally initiated by equipment failures and human failure or human error. And we've learned a lot from that, and a number of measures that we've taken have greatly reduced frequency of those types of initiating events in our own plants. This is our first experience with an extreme externally initiated, extreme external event initiated type of accident. And there's two areas where I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about lessons. One is, I think we've been finding that our capacity to measure things inside plants is not that great. The, the instrumentation available particularly for water level measurement and spent fuel pools. So where are we going with that type of lesson? And then the, the second dimension is the tremendous value, defense and depth that comes from having the capability to hook up portable equipment to uh, recharge batteries, to inject water. And what, where are we going with that type of lesson as well? If, if you could just, those, those two areas, maybe say a little bit more about what's happening. Um, first, uh, many of the technical details that I think you may be interested in, we're still assessing ourselves. And again, we, there's a lot of information is still speculation. And uh, until that gets a little more uh, known, I'm not sure, quite sure we can, how much we'll be able to talk about that uh, for now. Given what we do know, uh, a number of things have arisen that we would, um, uh, gives us pause to, to question. Uh, for example, the location of the switchgear, why did Japan cite it where they did and that it was susceptible to such, such an event? Uh, yes, they did plan for a tsunami, uh, but that could be a, something very simple that we're, we would need to factor into our planning for uh, future reactors, for example. In terms of, uh, and in fact, that's also one of the things we're looking at internally in the U.S. is to understand the location of equipment. Uh, in terms of um, the comparison to, say, TMI, I'm, I'm hesitant always to, to make comparisons because I don't want to sound like I'm piling on. Uh, there was a lot of operator uh, error issues as well as equipment malfunctions at TMI. Uh, we don't see right now anything uh, that would say that uh, Fukushima Daiichi operators did anything wrong. And as I think I've heard that there's up to three deaths there, which are tragic. One of the, um, um, I guess the um, things that apply to us right now is, have we thought through the planning, you know, the, the benefit of the planning? Have we trained the operators to handle things that are unforeseen? Uh, it's easy to have a simulator to say, well, I'm going to plan for a large break loca and everything is geared toward, toward that. It's a little different when you 
plan for multiple natural phenomena happening at a multiple unit event and everything, the whole world is falling around you. I'm not quite sure we've asked for that simulation yet, uh, but it's something that I think we're going to have to think about. Uh, and that's why the information notice went out, that's why the in technical temporary instructions went out, and that's why the bulletin went out, is to look at what could be done beyond design basis. Does that address your question, sir? Allison, uh, thank you. Uh, Allison, please. Uh, I'm sorry, did you have a further response? No, I'm sorry. I can add some particulars about the instrumentation capability of the U.S. plants if Thank you. you'd like me to do that. Yes, please. Okay. Um, there are several requirements in our regulations about instrumentation capability, looking at accident situations, and also going into what we would say unforeseen accident situations or beyond design basis accidents. Uh, if you look at the general design criteria, uh, general design criteria 13, 19, and 64 all relate to having instrumentation available. Um, after, certainly after TMI, the uh, focus on the robustness of that instrumentation and its range of uh, measuring capability uh, was, was looked at. IEEE started with a standard that NRC adopted as well as ANS that NRC adopted and turned into regular, Regulatory Guide 197, uh, which is uh, looking again at that instrumentation capability. Uh, so uh, there are all requirements in our 10 CFR uh, under 5034, which is our, if anyone's interested in, in that particular one, 5034F indicates what the post-TMI action items were. And there's a whole slew of instrumentation, including uh, the ability to monitor activity uh, in, in the core. Uh, that has also, that's been replaced by more updated methods of being able to infer core damage through hydrogen measurements in the containment um, and, of course, you know, temperatures, uh, water levels. There's temperature measurements and water level measurements in the sumps. And all of these are, uh, all of these range of uh, um, measurement range have are increased so that they are, I shouldn't say increased, that they are large so that they go beyond what the design basis would be and they are uh, required to be robust to handle these design basis accident conditions and also to uh, um, have an extended range of conditions for beyond design basis as well. So there is quite a bit of instrumentation available. What happened at Fukushima, whether or not Japan had these same requirements, well, again, at this stage, like Lawrence was saying, we don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, Allison and then Ernie. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. A first set has to do with Fukushima, and the second set has to do with the U.S. situation. So let me start with Fukushima. Jennifer, I don't think you should go very far. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So starting with Fukushima, um, I wonder if uh, in the past few days I've seen a pretty amazing video images of Pool 3, uh, which looks pretty terrible um, in terms of, of all the debris that fell into it. I wonder if you guys have any more status updates on that or Pool 1 or Pool 2. And then if you could also say something about if you, if you have any thinking on why um, these pools seem to run into trouble earlier than expected. In terms of uh, why they uh, came earlier than expected, the plant did suffer a severe catastrophic earthquake, which was, we know, beyond design basis, of, I think, of magnitude. Actually, the, the ground shaking wasn't quite beyond, beyond design basis. But it... it's, um, I think it's unknown, and I think we've made the assumption that it was. Okay. Um, it's, it's, and the plant did behave um, generally as we thought it would. Uh, it, it shut down. The right. diesels came on and it began to respond. We, we ourselves couldn't believe some of the pressures that we were seeing within the primary containment. Uh, it, it, and it was pretty severe. The pools themselves, uh, as, as well, having this pool that's sort of up in the air, uh, uh, it was, you know, the, the, this design was geared toward a, a, a refueling operation. It wasn't meant for long-term storage. It was meant for refueling. 
and it was meant to help convey that from the, mm -hmm. you know, you take off the drywall head, you flood it up, you refuel, you take the spent fuel and you put it to the refuel, uh, spent fuel pool, and there was a view that we would uh, have some availability to get it out when it was necessary to, uh, the government would take it. Uh, the pool at number four, as you probably know, had, was offloaded, yeah, okay. and uh, it had fresh used fuel, which has a very high heat load. Mm -hmm. That wasn't so much true in units one, two, and three, and on some of that fuel had been taken to this direct gas storage uh, at that time. Again, I don't have the numbers, but I believe that your BRC report does yeah. uh, have well, that we, in there. I, yeah, I know the numbers. Um, and in terms of what the other pools are, again, I think there's, there's much less heat load. Uh, there's older fuel that's right. in there. It, it, yeah, but there was still water loss in those and pools. And there still and was so, water loss. So but the, the, the severity um, of that was not as great as four. Right, but it maybe wasn't quite what was expected. So it was more than what was expected. So that's what I'm trying to know, understand whether you guys have addressed that issue yet. In terms of Jap Japan, the yes. answer is we're aware of it. In the Japanese government and the NISA as well as Tokyo Electric are trying to handle that. Uh, what we want to do is get the information from them and to assess it for our plants here. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to the U.S. situation. So, um, <clears throat> so this National Academy study that came out in 2005, 2006, uh, were all their recommendations instituted at all U.S. reactors? The National Academy study? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I could say now, that. This is about the spent fuel pools. I, uh, in terms of the heat loading, we know that uh, it depends upon a number of things, the design of the refueling systems and the spent fuel pools may or may not be safety related. Uh, it depends upon the design and its uh, framework in the mm -hmm. facility. Uh, we do know that typically the spent fuel pool cooling has, uh, is tied to the diesels, but it's not one of the initial loads that would come on in a post-accident situation. Uh, again, that's something that we're going to be assessing, and I know that Charlie Miller is, and his team are working at that. Well, you know, one of the, a couple of the recommendations in that National Academy report were to uh, redistribute the spent fuel in the pool so that you didn't have all the hot fuel next to each other, and the other one of, another one was, that. was to install sprinkler systems. Um, if they, your roof caves in, I don't know how your sprinkler systems help you, but anyway. I don't know that, I don't know of many plants, if any plants, have a sprinkler system. I do know okay. that there's cooling, uh, standard spent fuel cooling systems uh, at the facilities. I will say that there is a checkerboard pattern approach to right. try to move the warmer fuel away from the cooler fuel. And so, and another thing I think that the National Academy report recommended, although I may be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that it recommended additional studies. It sounds like they weren't com carried out because if your last study on the, fuel, uh, water loss in the pools was in 2004, then they weren't done. Yeah, I don't know that how much uh, s studies were done. I do know that, uh, as Jennifer pointed out, there were zerk fire studies that the NRC had done mm -hmm. uh, in relation to um, spent fuel pools and had been doing them for some time. So then my final question is, why not just move, why not uh, get ahead of the curve here and just go back to low density racks? That would, that would ameliorate a, a lot of these problems. That's uh, certainly something for consideration, um, but in order to do that, you may have to take warmer fuel out and put in dry cast storage sooner. Right. The, uh, you know, there some of these new dry cast storage systems are pushing it to three years after discharge, so... Three, three to five, you know, where one draws the line. There's a lot of older fuel in these pools. This is, not a, this is not a complicated problem. The only sticking point is the price tag, which isn't really that high relative to losing a, a reactor. Um, and the, the consequences that follow on with that. So it just seems to me that it's fairly straightforward to carry this out. You just figure out who you, who you attach that cost to and, and move on. The NRC is taking a look at what uh, could be required in that domain. Uh, I know that the uh, utilities have thus far said, you know, if they moved, you would have a, a cask that's only geared for a certain heat load. If you put warmer fuel in there, it, it may only be half full. Yeah, I know, but you don't have to put the warmer fuel in there. You can put the colder fuel. It's not right. 
Uh, yeah, well, I have two questions, but the, fir the first is to go back just to make sure I understand, to try to clarify uh, the discussion earlier on the pool number four. Um, so I guess about a month or so ago, I mean, I thought I heard a definitive statement from the NRC that uh, pool four had been drained. What I understood now is that's, that's unclear. The information that I have, and I think as Jennifer has pointed out, that they're still wondering about whether or not it was fully drained or not. There's still some uncertainty. Uh-huh. And, sorry? Uh, and, um, and then, well, it's a couple system, obviously. So, uh, and, and then what do, what do you think we understand or not about uh, explosion in uh, Pool 4 yes. uh, uh, building? Uh, uh, and to what extent did the having the fresh core in there drive whatever combination of water loss, explosion, et cetera, uh, took place? Yeah, we, that's something that is, uh, I know, that has been discussed internally, and right now I, there's, it would be speculative to try to say we understand the entire sequence of events that happened at that time. And that's, but I will say that is something that we're highly interested in. The simulations at, at Sandia and Oak Ridge, I think, are addressing this. Are those, are those integral to the, to the NRC study? The NRC is uh, evaluating the need for additional studies as well. I understand that that will be factored in, or elements of it will be factored in. Okay. And then a, okay, then a question that goes a little bit beyond the, the specifics uh, uh, investigation, uh, but uh, how is the investigation, uh, the ongoing investigation, intersecting uh, with license extension considerations? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, as you know, that there was a facility that was uh, granted renewal around the time of the event. Uh, it's my understanding that that will have to be assessed and that will be addressed at, uh, by the task force for what longer term actions may occur. I do not know what the outcome will be yet, though. Because again, I mean, I, I've heard some, some statements, some definitive statements made that then don't seem to stick, to be perfectly honest. In terms of you know, the intersection of this event and license renewal, we will have to wait and see what the task force recommends because I view that whatever the task force recommends may impact the current operating fleet regardless of their renewal status. But in the meantime, carrying on as usual? Uh, no, sir. Uh, we've issued a bulletin to get information and try to have them assess material. We will consider further actions as a result of responses and the task force report. Okay, I did not understand that. But. I have Jonathan and then John. Uh, Jonathan. I have a question um, at a more rudimentary level going back to Commissioner McFarland's last question. Um, it, two parts. How uh, densely were the was the spent fuel racked in Fukushima compared to what is the case in the U.S. and how important is that in determining survivability in these kinds of incidents? I will call on Jennifer for this. At this point, it's uh, not altogether clear how densely packed the pools were. So um, fortunately, my answer is probably not going to satisfy you. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the density of the, of the packing is uh, important in heat transfer. Um, if, and it also is a function of how long the, uh, the fuel has been removed from the core because, of course, you're decaying. If you're having, you know, the, you don't want to have, obviously, all the hot fuel in one location. Uh, we have done a great deal of studies, great deal of, um, of study in this area and have made licensees through requirements uh, re-rack their pools to enhance the cooling uh, to, again, uh, ameliorate any of the uh, concerns associated with the drain down. Uh, we do also have sprays that are uh, after the B5B requirements, if you've heard, they're now codified in 10 CFR 5054HH. That was after 9-11. Uh, there is a requirement for licensees to have uh, sprays, and it's a portable so that um, if, for instance, there was a problem with, with the ceiling, there is a portable, as um, a, the ability to have a uh, 
a, a portable system uh, brought in, uh, at least for injection, and then also the thought would be that uh, spargers would be available for, for the sprays. Uh, I don't know if that answers the, the com your question completely or, uh, or not. So we also have requirements on, on uh, hydrogen control internal to the containment building. And the, the concerns about the damage to the spent fuel pools was, and the explosions that occurred from the units uh, at one and three, so one, three, and four had damage, it's thought at this stage to be hydrogen detonation. Um, now, obviously, you don't have hydrogen if you had a full spent fuel pool at all times. So uh, there, these units are located next to each other. They do share some walls in, in some cases. Uh, there is a question, again, this is just uh, at this point conjecture, whether there was some uh, leaking of hydrogen into certain areas or when they were venting, if the venting system had leaks that caused hydrogen to accumulate in areas they didn't expect potentially the Unit 4 uh, um, contain, um, uh, reactor building, which encloses the, the spent fuel pool. So all of this right now, there's a big question mark. Again, um, the, the location of the hot assemblies with respect to the colder assemblies is, uh, is very important in the heat removal in the situation where you're going to be relying on air cooling. I have a follow-up, but it may be to Commissioner Moniz rather than to you. Uh, will you at some time, uh, Ernie, talk to us about the bearing of all of this on the need for uh, interim storage um, and what we saw in Sweden where um, hot fuel is moved pretty quickly away from the reactor into a storage pool? I don't know. <laughs> John. This may be either to you or to Jennifer. I don't wish to choose. Stay handy, Jennifer. Um, ever over the course of the last several decades, after TMI, after 9-11, after the earlier series of Japanese earthquakes, the NRC has taken a number of actions to strengthen the ability of the existing nuclear fleet to cope with events that weren't fully anticipated in the original design bases. And I wonder if you could just summarize some of those actions for the Commission. You know, I will turn this over to Jennifer as the Deputy Director in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research since they were the lead for that. Uh, really, the NRC was looking at uh, what we call a whole spectrum of events, really um, from all the time we've looked at risk studies, probabilistic risk, probabilistic risk assessment studies, or PRA studies is what I'll call it from now on. And those started um, with WASH, 740, I think, is the number. Uh, and then, of course, the more famous WASH 1400 study is around uh, 1978 or so by Norm Rasmussen. Uh, so those risk studies look at the whole, you know, the whole envelope of, of possible accident scenarios to the degree that we postulate them and we know them. Obviously, in the model, there won't be something that we haven't uh, um, anticipated uh, that or we feel is such a low probability, like a meteor crashing into a, a plant that we feel is beyond the probability of a re realistic probability. Uh, so after those events, I mean, excuse me, after those studies, uh, we recognize the importance of some systems uh, that um, are, would be, would be needed to uh, mitigate an accident if that accident were very low probability and, were, and, and those accidents were outside the uh, design basis. So uh, we have, therefore, uh, based on risk information, um, 
focused our regulatory attention on some systems that, that would not be uh, of importance during a design basis event. Um, and I would continue on um, with our risk insights. We've required station blackout uh, rule, which is uh, requires uh, emergency diesels in addition to the emergency diesels they already have to be able to uh, withstand uh, station blackout. Situations where you have loss of offsite power and loss of all AC power from the diesels. Uh, we uh, looked at the probability of anticipated transient without scram, which is a very low probability event, uh, but we felt the consequences could be potentially high, so we have regulatory requirements for the ability to withstand an ATWIS event. Uh, I would continue uh, on to say after, certainly after 9-11, there was obviously an event that we hadn't anticipated with aircraft impact. We looked at aircraft impact and uh, recognized uh, it was prudent to develop requirements to have the ability to bring in portable equipment just like the spent fuel pool sprays uh, that uh, could be there to mitigate an extensive damage uh, due to fires or explosions. So the NRC isn't only focused on design basis events. Uh, design, if people are familiar with the regulatory ver vernacular design basis events are those that are required to be analyzed and they're spelled out in chapter 15 of the, our standard review plan. Uh, but we do go beyond that and look into risk uh, insights to see if there's any vulnerabilities. The licensees were required uh, based on generic letter 8820 to look at uh, the risk profile of their plants and they performed independent plant examinations for both internal event and external events. So that's where the external events were, were considered and uh, after those were completed, after about uh, the external event work was completed in the earlier 90s, I was determined that uh, there were no um, um, undue or that no plants were, were causing undue risk to to the public health and safety. So we, we haven't just focused on the standard design basis. We've looked at an all, a whole host of, uh, of range of accidents. We're continuing that work in our state of the art reactor consequence analysis, uh, which uh, we'll be hopefully going out for public comment in the near future. Uh, that, as luck would have it, uh, looked at uh, station blackout as well as other scenarios uh, that could lead to to release from plants. It focused on a couple of plants that volunteered uh, to uh, participate with us to provide their re requisite data needed to do the analyses. One is the uh, Peach Bottom plant and that is a, a Mark I uh, containment which is exactly what the Fukushima plants, uh, one of the Fukushima plants or, or several of the Fukushima plants are. Um, and so we have an analysis, or we're working on analysis of the probability uh, from those external events that would be possible at those particular sites. Now, when you talk about external events, you have to be very site specific, very site focused. If you're sited like uh, Cooper in Nebraska, you're not going to have a tsunami to worry about. It's just physically impossible. So external events are very site specific. And uh, so the state of the art reactor consequence analysis has uh, focused on uh, two plants, Peach Bottom and Surrey, looked at external events and um, uh, has concluded uh, certain things about the, the, the transients and uh, the ultimate release and we'll be uh, looking at uh, going out for public comment as soon as we can. We're, we're, we are finding that our conclusions from SORCA that we have formed so far, which have showed that the sequences tend to uh, take much longer to evolve and the source term that could be uh, released is much, much lower than previous studies have shown. May, I, may I ask you, we're about through here in time, okay. but yep. uh, excuse me for interrupting, but uh, I'm, I'm impressed with the testimony. It's very tentative and it's very process oriented, what you've told us, and all of that is appropriate. And certainly the tentativeness of your judgments is appropriate. But here we are two months after this 
accident occurred, the American people are deeply concerned about the safety of nuclear plant operation in this country. Has the NRC reached any firm conclusions, clear conclusions, two months after this accident that you convey to the American people saying you're making these plants safer? Sir, as I pointed out in my conclusion, uh, uh, I think as the penultimate slide, uh, this is what Charlie Miller had stated to our Nuclear Regulatory Commission yesterday. At this time, we uh, do not have any information that would cause us to doubt the safety of the current operating fleet. We are taking all of this into consideration uh, and we do anticipate that we may make changes to the regulatory framework as well as require uh, plants to do additional measures. But at, but at this point, you have nothing to say to the American people about uh, steps that are necessary to improve the safety of nuclear plant operations in the United States. Uh, beyond what we've said in the information notice and the bulletins and what we, inspection guidance we have given to our on-site residents, well, what we, is that? We, I mean, that doesn't mean anything to me at all. Yes, sir, I understand. It's, uh, it will take time to assess, and it will take time to uh, look at very uh, complex systems and understand their interactions with one another. Well, I, I understand the tentativeness of your position, but, uh, and I'm not the technical expert that we have around this table, but it does seem to me 60 days after this accident, you ought to be able to reach some very firm conclusions about what, if anything, is necessary. And if nothing is necessary, then that's the, a very important conclusion. Yes, sir, I understand. I, at this time, we've not identified uh, any issues that undermine our confidence in the current fleet. So you're, we, you're we saying may... at this time that as a result of the Japanese accident, there is nothing that needs to be done in the American nuclear reactors across this country. Is that your position this morning? My position is that uh, we have asked the utilities to reevaluate their emergency measures. We've asked them to our inspectors to inspect uh, those activities to date. We've asked our licensees for additional information and we are studying the complexity of this, this event um, to, um, to, to understand whether or not we should impose more requirements, which I suspect okay. right. will, but it will not be out until the uh, task force does its initial report in July. I see. Uh, John? Mr. Chairman, I too share the sense that the answer is even more tentative than it needs to be. But as the operator of 17 nuclear plants, I'd like to add the worm's perspective on the bird. Uh, <laughs> it, it is one of the reluctant geniuses of American nuclear regulation that it has never said that the search for enough is enough is over. In the years that I have been dealing with nuclear power regulation in this nation, the NRC and even before it the sometimes maligned AEC we're always willing to take into account new information to study and to impose new requirements. What I think has happened in the 60 days, and like you, I would wish that it were even more unequivocal, but what has happened is the NRC has said through its chairman, through its operating officers, through its reports to Congress, that it continues to believe the American nuclear fleet is safe, but it's slowly and patiently looking for ways to make it even safer. There is no doubt whatsoever that one of the things that it will consider is Commissioner McFarland's suggestion on redistributing the spent fuel sooner. I'm 
quite certain this also adds to the argument for Commissioner Lash's point that an interim storage facility would be a better way to do that. Um, it will also be looking at a number of other things. As the operator, I cannot tell you today exactly how the NRC will prioritize such new requirements as it may find necessary. But one thing I know is that the NRC will continue to try to evaluate and rank order new requirements. Uh, Jennifer, and I apologize for not remembering your last name, you know, listed some of the things that have been done over decades to impose requirements that go beyond the original design. We utilities are always a little troubled by that because like an airplane, we like a design to be affirmed once it's done. But this industry in this country has stayed, stayed safe uh, in significant part because the NRC has been willing both to make conclusions that it is safe but also to continue to seek new, re new requirements where it thinks it's appropriate. And that is a process at least as frustrating for the utility uh, as it is for the independent commission or the congressional committee chairman, but it is a process that's delivered a great deal of safety to the American public. I'm uh, delighted to hear your judgment about the NRC. I, I really don't have a judgment about the NRC. I've not dealt with them enough to know one way or the other. Uh, but I am interested in what your firm conclusions are as a result of the Japanese accident and how it affects the American people and the safety of these plants. And I don't think you have forever to answer that question. No, sir. I, I think it has to be coming out of you fairly soon, as quickly as you can. Now, obviously, these are very complex matters, far more complex, I'm sure, than I appreciate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm impatient, I guess. <laughs> and I think the American people are impatient. And I think you folks have to understand uh, the result of a, Im the impact of an incident like Japan on nuclear power in this country. But not just in this country. Germany, as I understand, decide they're going to back away from nuclear power completely because of what happened in Japan, at least in part. I don't think we're at that point in the United States for reasons John has stated very well. But on the other hand, I don't think it's a situation where you can just ignore it. I think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is under a spotlight. And uh, the pressure's on you. The American people have confidence in you, I hope, and I trust. And they're expecting you to perform well. Thank you. I think, uh, yes, Al? It's, it's really just to, to pick up on the timing uh, a question. I understand that the first priorities have to be about reactor safety, and that uh, that makes sense. Uh, it does sound, however, like you're getting much of your information from the Japanese government, and therefore do not really have control over the pace at which you're making progress. This is particularly important to us. We've been asked to make recommendations about the back end of the fuel cycle, right? And we're going to hear today tentative recommendations. We all understand that we would like, before we make final recommendations, to know as much as we can that is uh, germane, from, that's been learned from Fukushima. Um, and without more information on what happened with the spent fuel and why, whether in the pools or the dry casks, it is extraordinarily difficult for us to say with confidence the kinds of things that we would have said with confidence two months ago. Uh, and so this concern about the timing is not simply the concern about, uh, or not solely the concern about assuring the safety of nuclear power in the United States, but it also uh, reflects upon the question the President has asked us about the back end of the fuel cycle because a portion of the back end of the fuel cycle is at Fukushima. So do you have any sense of what the timing might be? I understand it's not entirely in your control of what the timing might be as to when we might 
feel with some confidence that we understand what went on with the spent fuel at Fukushima, both in pools and in dry cask storage. The, um, uh, the task force that is currently considering this right now, I know, has outlined an extensive report that they're trying to address, and of which spent fuels are a particularly large part of that, as well as the reactors. Um, I wish I could give you more clarity. Uh, they will brief the commission on July 19th, and the report will be out that month. It will be made public, and uh, we will have probably the best understanding then as to uh, what recommendations for uh, storage and spent fuel pools and dry cast storage uh, for the power plant sites at that time. And I wish I could give you some more certainty on that, more clarity on that. We'll conclude this with uh, Ernie. Did you? Want to say my yeah, I just wanted to follow up really on the chairman's uh, earlier uh, questions. Um, first, on this question of kind of confidence in the commission, et cetera, I just note that uh, I mean I had the pleasure of uh, testifying a few weeks ago, and it was very clear that there were uh, signals coming out of uh, this was in the Senate uh, that a different form of review might very well be sought, uh, and I think that's where a crisper uh, approach in the NRC could help uh, have a more streamlined, shall we say, uh, approach. Uh, the absence of it, I think, will lead to multiplicity of reviews that may not uh, clarify the situation. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, you made an intriguing statement. Uh, you said that the pool the spent pool design uh, at Fukushima, uh, you, roughly speaking, you said it was made for refueling, not for storage. Doesn't that then suggest a certain line of inquiry and conclusion on the Commission's part? Uh, I can only speculate what the Commission might do uh, with information like that. Um, as you well know, the, the pools it's not, it's not information. It's just, it was a statement of fact. Yeah. In fact, a fact that's been around for a long time. Yes, yes sir. Uh, the, the fuel for many years built up, and they had to re-rack, as I know you're aware, and uh, the density in the pools became more and more. I understand. Uh, I think we'll have to deal and assess that at, at, as part of this uh, future study. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kukai. It's not like I'm duh. sorry. I'm sorry, Richard. So. Yeah. Allow me to um, come a little bit to the defense of the NRC, if I may, here. Um, I'm not attacking I, it. I'm just trying to get them to do something. Well, and it's not my, – my, my, the problem I think we confront is that the capacity to assemble the engineering information to do enable a thorough assessment may not dovetail well with the political need to be able to say things about what that assessment would yield. Um, we controlled the information on Three Mile Island, and it was a couple of years until we got into the reactor and understood the extent of the fuel damage, which was a, a very important factor in understanding the, uh, the sequence of events. So I think that there is a need to do as, go as far as you can and as fast as you can, but I think we all ought to recognize that a full evaluation of this accident may be a year or two before we have all the information that we need to actually have a complete understanding. Richard, I was not asking for a full and complete statement. I just said it's 60 days, and I wanted to know if any conclusions had been reached. That's all That's I wanted to know, any conclusions. And the only conclusion I hear is that so far as you know at this point, nothing needs to be done with regard to the safety of American reactors as a result of what we've learned from Japan. Now, that's what I take from your testimony today. And that's, that's my concern. You're absolutely right, of course, about deliberation. And I fully appreciate the tentativeness of what you have to say. Uh, you don't want to be too dogmatic here. Uh, but may I, but I would also add that, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I just okay. add that, to go back to get my question and Dick's point, there are some decisions that can be addressed without complete information yeah. about the accident. Yeah. Some not, but some there are. 
Mayor, Mayor, I, I you're going to have the final word. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, I do think it's important to point out that the most important action that has already been taken with respect to increasing safety based on lessons learned from Japan is to review the U.S. procedures for addressing this type of accident from the perspective of hooking up portable equipment and getting coolant in injection initiated and power uh, uh, connected in a timely way. Because the fact that that did not happen in a timely way in Japan great, uh, uh, contributed greatly to increasing the severity of the accident. And, and that action has been taken. And of all of the things that can reduce risk for this type of external event, that's probably the, the largest one. And so I would say that, that there have been actions taken which address major elements of the risk uh, based on these lessons. Uh, I, uh, so thing, things have been happening that make a difference. Other questions, such as whether or not the density of racking is an issue, that's going to take a longer time to figure out because there's very incomplete and contradictory information about what has actually happened to fuel that might have uncovered. But the most, the most important near-term actions, I think, have been taken already. Dr. Kokaku, thank you very much for your presentation. You and your colleagues, I know, have done a lot of work for this. We are deeply appreciative of that. So we thank you. We also thank Jennifer for her comments uh, here today as well. Now we go to Vicki Bailey, who will introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kokaiko. Uh, we would now like to hear from Mr. Glenn Podonsky. Uh, is he here? Okay. Mr. Podonsky is the U.S. Department of Energy's Chief Health, Safety, and Security Officer. Mr. Podonsky's organization is coordinating the department's review of the safety of DOE nuclear facilities in light of the events at Fukushima uh, nuclear power station in Japan. So this morning we will hear about the ongoing safety review and any preliminary results. Mr. Podonsky, thank you for being here today. Thank you and, uh, and good morning. And um, it's my experience in Washington that most witnesses uh, or presenters in front of commissions or the Congress start off with, thank you for inviting me to speak. And I will do that in a minute but I want to tell you why I really mean it. In my almost three decades at the department, I've actually worked with many members of the commission, directly or indirectly with your staffs. For example, Senator Domenici over the years had many issues with the Department of Energy, working, and I worked with uh, Clay Sell, Pete Lyons, General Scowcroft, uh, when he had a staff of nuclear command and controls looking at the security of the NNSA, I worked with their staff, uh, Congressman Hamilton, when you and Senator Baker conducted the security review of the lost hard drives at Los Alamos, I worked with your, your committee then. Uh, Commissioner Ayers, for the last five years, I've been working with the uh, uh, labor force on worker health and safety. Uh, Commissioner Moniz, when he was undersecretary, I worked uh, for him and with him on many projects. Uh, Commissioner Bailey, uh, when you were Assistant Secretary, I worked with your staff. And when I look at the backgrounds of all the commission uh, s serving, uh, I hearken back to Senator Domenici's opening comment last March at the first meeting, is that this will not be a commission where the report sits on the shelf. While you do not need my endorsement, I'm just saying I have firsthand experience over three decades that I believe that the members of this commission will, in fact, produce a report that won't sit on the shelf. And that is why this morning I thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the subject of nuclear safety at DOE sites and what the DOE is doing in response to the nuclear accidents. While I'm here representing the department as a whole, I actually serve as the DOE's chief health safety and security officer. My organization is unique in the entire executive branch as we are responsible for independently assessing the performance of the department in terms of environment, safety, health, safeguard security, emergency management, cybersecurity. My organization is totally independent. 
from management responsibilities for production or mission or site budgets. This enables us to report unbiasedly to the secretary and to congressional committees on how effective or ineffective DOE is performing its function. Nuclear safety is a priority at DOE today. And it has been actually for the last 15 years, DOE has implemented a cohesive integrated safety management program to strengthen the department's nuclear facilities and operations. In light of the recent events in Japan, uh, we're not resting on what we've already done. We're actually currently reviewing our nuclear safety policies, our standards, our practices to ensure a robust culture of safety throughout all the aspects of the department's nuclear facilities and operations. We've embarked on a new era of proactive nuclear safety within the DOE, one that even more than ever before embraces fundamental importance of nuclear safety and recognizes that DOE cannot succeed in its mission without first protecting our workers, the public, and the environment. Even before the events at Fukushima, DOE, under the leadership of Secretary Chu and Deputy Secretary Poneman, was enhancing the safety of our nuclear facility and operations. We have an integrated approach to safety management, and particularly over the past few years, we have taken numerous steps to strengthen oversight of the nuclear facilities and ensure a culture of safety throughout the complex. We have also adopted a graded approach to safety with a higher risk consequence facilities and activities to provide a higher degree of protection of oversight than lower consequence activities. Most recently, on February 8, 2011, Deputy Secretary issued a revised nuclear safety policy applicable to all departmental elements with the responsibility for nuclear facility safety. This covers expectation for the design, construction, operation, and decommissioning of our nuclear facilities in a manner that would ensure adequate protection of the workers, the public, and the environment. The department's nuclear enterprise is vast, it's complex. We own or operate nearly 200 nuclear facilities throughout the United States. And these range from complex facilities with multiple nuclear processes to inactive facilities or structures. The breadth of these activities have demanded an integrated strategy that I've just mentioned to identify, development, and implement management and safety initiatives appropriate to the given site. In looking at DOE as a whole, it's important to understand that DOE nuclear facilities are very different. I want to repeat that. They're very different from commercial nuclear reactors and face different safety issues. Of the nuclear facilities that I just mentioned, nearly 200, only four are nuclear reactors. And only two of those four are what we call category one nuclear facilities. Hazard category one is a nuclear facility in our vernacular that means that they could conceivably cause a release off-site. In contrast, all commercial nuclear power reactors in our vernacular would be considered category one facilities. Additionally, the reactors at DOE you should know are a much lower power level or residual heat level than our experience in the commercial nuclear industry. The remaining 190 plus nuclear facilities are what we call hazard, hazard category two or lower. It's important to understand that these facilities do not represent the same potential hazard to the public. Nevertheless, we thoroughly analyze all of our DOE nuclear facilities to ensure we understand and can mitigate potential accidents and hazards, such as fires that could cause release of radioactive materials to mitigate these events. We put in high quality safety systems, which are verified to be working through rigorous testing and maintenance programs. The secretary and the deputy secretary bear the ultimate responsibility for nuclear safety at our department. Line managers are responsible for establishing achieving and maintaining stringent safety performance expectations and requirements at these facilities. We currently have three undersecretaries. They serve as what we call the DOE Central Technical Authorities and are responsible for ensuring effective understanding and implementation of nuclear safety requirements. 
the central technical authorities are supported by the department's Office of the Chief Nuclear Safety and the NNSA Office of Chief Nuclear Safety. That may sound confusing, it may sound bureaucratic, but what it actually does is it creates offices that provide nuclear advice to senior line managers and they provide their own oversight to ensure consistent execution of field level nuclear safety responsibilities. The DOE contractor management, they are also responsible for rigorous implementation of the safety expectations and requirements set forth by the department. A crucial independent check of these efforts comes from my office as being responsible for policy development, independent oversight, and regulatory enforcement to ensure that every DOE nuclear facility adheres to the highest levels of nuclear safety. Recently, we've elevated the Office of Nuclear Safety to be a separate re office reporting directly to me. Completing this internal safety and oversight is the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, the DNFSB. That is an independent agency established by Congress in 1988 to provide recommendations to the Secretary regarding establishing and operating in accordance with highest nuclear standards. The Board reviews the content and implementation of standards relating to design, construction, operation, and decommissioning of the Department's defense nuclear facilities. Through improvements from our ongoing interface with the DNFSB, I can tell you that the Department has materially improved the safety of our defense nuclear facilities over the last 23 years. Now, since 2008, in response to a very critical GAO report about the department need, and its entitlement was, entitled was, Department Energy needs to strengthen its independent oversight of nuclear facilities. DOE undertook a number of actions that started with the previous administration and has continued with the current administration. These actions include the following. We've created and implemented a site lead approach to prioritize key oversight activities for each site. We've conducted targeted inspections and continuously monitor site performance. We revised inspection selection practices to prioritize oversight of safety bases and higher hazard nuclear facilities. We've created a tracking system for monitoring and evaluating the safety status of higher nuclear facilities. We added more nuclear engineers to both my independent oversight group as well as the nuclear safety offices. We've improved the National Training Center's training programs by incorporating 23 safety basis courses into the curriculum. We've prioritized enforcement practices to devote more attention to the most serious events. We've increased the DOE program management engagement in enforcement proceedings to enable prompt action and ownership by what we call the line. We've increased the transparency of all that we are doing by making inspection reports publicly available on our web, and we've created a new dedicated web page to share DOE nuclear safety information. We have a good safety record for nuclear. It's instilled a degree of rigor in our nuclear facility operations through the issuance of regulations, development of safety bases, enhanced line oversight, training and qualification programs, and enhanced conduct of operations. While the department has already done a lot to advance nuclear safety, we will not be complacent. In particular, the accident in Japan stands as a global reminder for the need of continuing vigilance and the commitment to nuclear safety that cannot be ignored. These events highlight the importance of a robust safety culture and compel DOE to ensure the primacy of safety throughout our complex. The Deepwater Horizon spill, which occurred last year at this time, also teaches us about the importance of a positive safety culture and how a series of things can go wrong in any complex system. We're also taking other actions to strengthen our nuclear safety program. I just talked about what we're doing for nuclear safety oversight. Let me now talk about what we're doing for the nuclear safety program itself. In generally along the lines of mission performance, accountability, strategy, oversight, training, 
and infrastructure. Just some of these are we're reassessing our nuclear safety metrics to assure that they clearly track safety performance, critically assessing on their performance, monitoring trends, and sharing best practices. The newly appointed Assistant Deputy Secretary, Admiral Mel Williams, just established a Nuclear Safety and Security Council. This council is a group of nuclear experts who will assist in the performance of metrics, trends, and lessons learned, and this was just created last week. We have an issuance of revised guidance associated with what we call integrated safety management and oversight of high hazard nuclear facilities that will provide additional information on approaches for managing safety at our nuclear facilities. We've increased our effectiveness of oversight activities by focusing the independent oversight on more on the nuclear operations as the GAO appro appropriately pointed out in 2008. We've established a training program to provide a continuum of training throughout nuclear safety professional's career, career. This is an area, I must say, that has been elusive to the department all the way back to uh, Secretary uh, Watkins. Uh, when he wanted to have a training program, he wanted to combine training efforts. We never did. We are doing that now. We have reached an agreement. This is bureaucratic, but it helps you understand. We've reached an agreement to bring all these disparate groups together under one group at our National Training Center, and the individual that's going to run that for the department uh, is coming out of the Albuquerque Service Center, and again, for everybody here, that doesn't mean a lot, but it's a high-level position, and people are coming together to finally do what we haven't been able to do for close to 20 years. We're also assessing staffing gaps and hiring needs on technical personnel to assure that they are properly trained, qualified, and certified to perform nuclear safety duties. Now, in response to Fukushima, we've taken a number of actions specifically in regards to what happened. Within 12 days of the event, Secretary Chu, who is the first secretary to ever issue a safety bulletin that normally comes out of my position. But he wanted to make sure that the DOE elements understood its importance. And the safety bulletin that I believe you all have seen requires all DOE higher hazard nuclear facilities to step back and perform a self-critical review of their safety analysis. While DOE continuously analyzes the safety of all of our facilities, it's devoted a significant resources to upgrading the facilities to meet seismic protection standards. We want to re-examine these areas in light of what we're hearing about Japan. As discussed in my advanced technical paper that I provided the commission, uh, we have begun to receive the responses uh, we actually have the responses for the two Category 1 facilities uh, and the responses for the Category 2 facilities coincidentally are due today. At this time, we do have results for the highest uh, category of facilities uh, of particular note. Uh, the site contractors have re-verified that all the safety systems and controls are functioning as intended and are operable. But no, being part of DOE, we just don't trust the contractors to tell us so. The line management at the site has re reviewed the results, and they report them to be accurate and reliable. But now the headquarters, my organization, together with the other nuclear functions, are looking at what was done. So yes, we have checkers checking the checkers, but you need to do that with something as important as this. Our review of the hazard category facilities We'll be starting today as they, as they come in, uh, and we believe that taking the additional step of systematically evaluating the hazards at CAT-2 facilities is a prudent one. We understand that the public and our stakeholders will and should expect that DOE should do everything it can to prevent any nuclear incident. The review of nuclear facilities is not a paper exercise. DOE line management together with my office uh, as the DOE safety organization. We're carefully reviewing the results and we're serious about taking the actions as exemplified by the Secretary's personal involvement. 
DOE will be looking at the results from two perspectives. We will look individually at the results for each site to determine what makes sense at that site. We will also look collectively at the results to determine if we need to make more global changes, such as changes to requirements or guidance. We will review vulnerabilities related to beyond design basis events in response to what we are learning from the Japanese situation. Now, there's something else I want to come forward with and tell you that the Deputy Secretary is hosting a nuclear safety workshop on June 6th to the 7th here in Washington, actually Crystal City. And this is to address nuclear safety issues related to the accident in Japan specifically and to gather information from other agencies such as NRC, INPO, DNFSB, and from very expert, various experts such as experts in seismic events. We have senior government level officials at all levels participating uh, from NRC, from Defense Board, from FEMA, from EPA. Um, our expectation is that it's an important workshop that will be able to have tangible recommendations that DOE will look at to see if there's any further actions we need to take. I'd like to um, invite the Commission to attend participate in whatever capacity while it's closed to the public and the press because we want to make sure that we can have total candor discussion uh, about the uh, nuclear situation and make sure we understand what we're, what we're doing. Um, and since we have so many of the top level uh, nuclear experts as well in government, uh, we think that would be a uh, a very interesting and very dynamic activity for everybody who's interested in the nuclear business. Next steps, the safety bulletin and workshop are only the first ones, not the last. We're committed to follow the events from the Japanese accident and we will evaluate the responses to the safety bulletin. As we learn more, we may well identify additional actions that would further reduce risk or improve our ability to respond to severe natural disasters. I will be traveling to Japan uh, in two weeks, three weeks, uh, to meet with the Japanese officials to learn more ourselves, uh, as also to meet with a program that we have, which is the Radiation Effects Foundation Research Foundation, which studies the effects of radiation from Nagasaki and Hiroshima and I will we'll be meeting with that panel of governors as well. Now, I would like to say that my NRC colleagues had a lifeline. I'd like to call, have DOE call a friend, and I would like to start right off and invite the new director of the Office of Nuclear Safety, Dr. Jim O'Brien, to join me so we can be responsive in a timely way to any of your questions. Thank you, Glenn. And we'll have uh, your, your friend come up uh, alongside of you. Uh, can you say his name again? I, I want to make sure. Uh, Dr. Jim O'Brien. He is the director of the newly created <laughs> Office of Nuclear Safety. Okay. All right. Questions from commissioners? Pierre and Mark, Allison. Thank you. In the questions that, that you received and were asked to answer, they, they focused on safety of DOE nuclear facilities. I'd like to expand a little bit to uh, ask you a couple of questions related to DOE activities to support NRC and in particular the Japanese in responding to the accident. The uh, one thing that strikes me, having seen the photos from the Unit 3 spent fuel pool that is filled with debris, is that it looks a lot like actually the K-Basin pool that uh, was successfully cleaned up. So in, in fact, it, it, there's, there's precedent for having gone back and mitigating these sorts of things and that, that knowledge and expertise rely, uh, resides in the DOE. So, Maybe could you, could you discuss a few of the things perhaps that DOE has been doing to 
to um, help others uh, with respect to the consequences of this accident? Sure, I'll, I'll start and I'll, uh, and I'll ask my friend to continue. Um, uh, immediately, DOE stood up a nuclear command control center uh, from uh, Undersecretary Tom D'Agostino uh, to be responsive to anything that they might need for emergency operations, and Admiral Kroll uh, dispatched uh, radiological teams uh, to monitor uh, the area. Um, additionally, uh, Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, uh, Pete Lyons, uh, has uh, been in constant contact with the NRC. Uh, and I want to hearken back to this workshop that we're putting together. This is just not a normal DOE, uh, DOE or government workshop. This is a workshop that we are looking for a sharing of specific lessons learned that we have from our experiences uh, in our own facilities like Rocky Flats, Mound, Fernald, uh, and our experiences at Savannah River. Uh, it's still in the early stages because, um, as you may have realized, NRC, I'm sure, is getting a lot of assistance from INPO and others. Uh, Jim? Anything to add? Um, just, just, and I know everybody knows this already, that, you know, the United States, as well as uh, other international communities, are all working together to help the Japanese in the recovery, and we'll, we'll certainly continue to do that in any manner that, that we can, and I know Secretary Chu is dedicated to do that and had put together and still has, uh, I think, a group of five senior scientist leaders with the Department of Energy that have been working with uh, him and uh, the Japanese officials to uh, see where we can help out. Thank you. Mark? Thank you. Uh, you know, I want to start out by saying, and and I've uh, said this more than one occasion that uh, al although the uh, DOE takes some some hits once in a while from a lot of people, uh, I want to say again the DOE is the best friend that construction workers have, that maintenance workers have, and uh, operations and security workers have. Uh, we have the confidence that when our workers go to work in the morning, they're going to return to their family in the same shape they went to work, and a lot of that is due to the good work of your offices. So I want to thank you. Uh, back when we met in September, uh, I asked for a review to determine uh, how, how safe workers are in the U.S. nuclear industry. And I suggested if workers are well protected, it is more likely that the public will be well protected as well. Now, in light of the events in Japan, this has become pretty much a central issue. And it would appear that at least at the Fukushima nuclear power plant, the emergency response workers have been placed at very significant risk. Now, I look forward to hearing more about that today, but in response to my request, the staff contracted with Stone Turn Consultants for a study of occupational safety and health throughout the fuel cycle, and to examine past history since the Three Mile Island, the current state of safety and future uh, risk. They produced a pretty remarkable study. In terms of its scope, and I would say depth, especially in light of the short time available to complete it. Uh, the report's full of data, and I encourage uh, all of you and all of my fellow commissioners to take a look at it. But they found that safety in the nuclear industry is very good. Radiation safety in the nuclear industry has improved greatly since Three Mile Island. The occupational safety and health risk in nuclear power plants are 80 to 90 percent lower compared to fossil plants, and hydro plants, even though nuclear plants run at a capacity of over 90 percent compared to 65 percent in fossil plants and 40 percent in hydro plants. However, they also found that there have been numerous near disasters in nuclear plants over the years, and they characterize the risk underlying these events in very different ways uh, than I have heard discussed here. According to this report, uh, the main risk in this industry, the main risk in this industry, are inexperience with the operations 
of complex technologies or external risk and therefore failure to effectively address operational failures that arise from such circumstances. Also overconfidence in technologies and in uh, probabilistic risk assessment. Too often a good risk assessment is interpreted as something being fail safe when it's not. Uh, complacency or negligence, particularly in terms of performing operational monitoring and maintenance, intentional risk taking to cut corners or costs. So as you can see, the risks described here are not so much about earthquakes or tsunamis or terrorism or the like. They're about the people who work in the industry and, and how well they operate it, which is why investigators took a look at the safety culture and how oversight is performed. They provide many favorable findings, but they also find many areas where there is room for improvement, in, in, including stronger labor management collaboration, which I know the department is very supportive. They make many other findings that in the interest of time, and I won't go into now, but importantly, they do not see unmanageable risk in the back end of the once through nuclear fuel cycle. Finally, they note that all the sources of electricity generation pose very high risk. They urge us to judge this issue according to the relative risk of each of these sources and how well these risks are managed. <clears throat> Nuclear power may be high technology, but its development and operation are still very clearly human endeavors. And the human factor has to be an important part of our deliberations. There are very many good thoughts in this report and that I hope that we will uh, consider very carefully. And, and it was a very worthwhile report. I don't know if you've seen it, but I think you'll find it very interesting. It's posted on the uh, BRC website. So again, I want to thank you and I want to make make it clear that, that the report clearly shows that the nuclear industry is the safest industry in my industry in which we lose four workers die every single day they go to work in this country. Thank you. May, may I uh, comment on Commissioner Ayers? Um, worker health and safety is a priority of the Department of Energy. It's not just cheap talk. When my office was created five years ago, uh, it was pulling all the worker health and safety programs together, the security programs, the environmental. Uh, and what we've done for sustainability is to make sure that we also reached out, as you well know, to all the national labor unions. Um, and it first started under the Republican administration, it's continued under the Democratic administration. And the importance of that is communication uh, on a quarterly basis with all the major unions so we get feedback directly as the independent safety office to find out what the issues are at the worker level. Not to take away the line's responsibility to make sure that the workers feel a sense that people really are watching over what the contractors are doing. Because we agree and Secretary Chu has in one of his major principles is that um, our human resources are our most valuable asset and we take that to heart. We can't get our mission done if we don't have the people to do it and if they don't feel that they have the sense that the department will take care of them. And while this is not part of this commission, one of the things that we are also responsible is taking care of the former worker program, those Cold War warriors who were responsible for the nuclear weapons program in the 40s and 50s and we make sure that they get their medical screenings, we make sure that they get their uh, benefits the best as they can with Labor Department. And the reason I mention that is because it's the whole picture that you have to understand. And if those workers are going to feel safe in not only the nuclear, but also just the industrial uh, uh, safety side of the house, they have to feel that they have a uh, safety culture that management believes in and follows. Thank you, Commissioner Ayers. Um, Commissioner McFarland. Thank you, Commissioner Bailey. <laughs> Okay, a, c a couple of technical questions. Um, so the two hazard category one um, locations that you've identified, the advanced test reactor and the high flux isotope reactor, only one of them has a spent fuel pool, is that correct? 
No, they both have. They both have spent fuel pools. And are the is the spent fuel in the pools in a dense packed arrangement? I don't know the answer to that question. I okay. don't. They're t they're a totally different type of fuel. So I don't. We don't. As far as I am aware, we don't differentiate between the dense pack and normal pack because okay. we don't have that issue that we are dealing with. Okay. And it, like I said, it's a total different type of fuel, a lot smaller. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, it's metal fuel. Is that metal fuel? It's aluminum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, aluminum clad. Right. Aluminum clad. Since we didn't answer the question, does that mean I need to phone another friend? <laughs> Well, I'm just curious as to the situation in those pools now that you brought them up. But, um, Maybe a follow-up answer. Yeah, a follow-up answer would be, you don't have to find out right away, but, you know, it would be interesting to know and put it on the record. Um, and then the other question I have is that, okay, so you've got these three categories of hazard facilities. The thought that occurs to me is, well, you have a couple of facilities, Savannah Riverside and, and Hanford in particular, where you have these very large containers of liquid high-level waste and um, were either facility to experience perhaps a large seismic event where those containers were severely disrupted, you would lose all of that material and it would get into the groundwater which would go off site, but those facilities are not listed as category one. Why? <clears throat> the, um, the main pathway of concern that we have is the airborne which would cause the more immediate um, uh, impact to the public and require the emergency, res quicker emergency response. Uh, so th that is the reason that these are at uh, that different category of level as far as... Um, so waterborne transport is not a con as much of a concern? It's, it is a concern and the tanks are, you know, on larger sites in, on, um, in areas where the, um, the release uh, is not expected from those design basis events to get there. And we are looking at the, the beyond design basis events to see exactly what is our vulnerabilities and what we need to do to reduce those vulnerabilities. And will that be part of these studies that you're doing now in, in response to the Fukushima react accident? Yes, it will be. Thank you, Commissioner McFarland. Uh, Commissioner McNeese? Uh, I have uh, a number of questions. Uh, maybe I'll have to divide it up into sessions. Uh, but one is to follow on Allison's uh, comment just now. Uh, I am a little bit surprised about uh, the Category 1 uh, not including uh, the waste tanks, uh, not, and I mean for airborne uh, release. Uh, first of all, I remember when we were working together, uh, the charms of dealing with hydrogen, hydrogen burping of, uh, of tanks. Uh, I do uh, invoke actual data, the biggest, arguably the biggest off-site release uh, in Russia uh, may have been Mayak. Uh, a waste tank. Uh, there's the issues of a bomb in a waste tank. So I just do, I, I really don't understand how this is not uh, a, a category one and if you have any comment on that, uh, great. Uh, and similarly, uh, I would, now it depends upon whether it's obviously DOE or NRC, et cetera, but fundamentally in this context, uh, I'd uh, be curious about your reaction to the possibility that a large aqueous, aqueous reprocessing plant uh, would not be in that same uh, category. Any comments on that? And I'll come back to a second question. Well, on both, on both areas, uh, Commissioner Moniz, I think, uh, I think clearly they're good questions. Uh, uh, and I'm hoping that our review will ask ourselves why are we doing and not categorizing the tanks, because we, we do know how volatile those those have been over many many years, uh, and one of the things that I've challenged our nuclear safety uh, group uh, is to literally think out of the box. We've gotten when I said in my opening statement that we are far different than the commercial reactor world. That doesn't mean that we don't have safety issues that we need to really consider 
and reevaluate. And I'm looking for the um, the uh, out of the box thinking at the workshop, and I'm also looking at this newly created uh, council that uh, Admiral uh, uh, set up to talk about these issues. Because clearly the line functions are the ones who help determine, but as the safety organization, we need to also uh, challenge the line functions. So uh, my, my answer is those are good questions, and I don't have a cogent answer as to why, and I don't think, uh, I don't know whether Jim does or not. I can just add one thing, is that the, the requirements that are related to both HAZ category one and two are in essence the same as far as your analysis and the control sets that you derive from them. So the protection provided for the facilities, whether they're designated HAZ category one or HAZ category two, or in essence, the same. The messaging is very different, however. Yeah. That, and, that I, is and I don't believe, I, well, I would suggest you look we, at we, it. We fully understand Fine. and agree. Um, may I ask a second question, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, uh, and here, uh, Glenn, uh, for purposes of your uh, self-protection, I would I'd invite an answer of yes, no, or no comment. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned uh, DNFSB, and I, and I put that in a broader context for, for our concerns here. Uh, I mean, Congress uh, seems to have a uh, particular af affection for DOE uh, uh, in wanting to be very helpful with special oversight bodies uh, on top of the generic ones like GAO. So it's DNFSB, it's TRB, uh, et cetera. Uh, do you find this uh, helpful to have these additional layers? <laughs> We, uh, uh, yes, no, or no comment? Uh, <laughs> when Chairman Dingo asked me to give him just a yes or no, I had to say in a hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I say, Mr. Commissioner, I, I have to give you a little broader uh, answer because the yes or no will get me into trouble. Um, in the truth of the matter is, as a, as a career civil servant for over 36 years, I've learned that it's not wise not to take help. Uh, if it's offered in the spirit of truly helping. And the Defense Board, uh, I would tell you, over the last uh, 23 years that I've been working with them, actually does help the department and has done so uh, in the past. Congressional hearings actually help at times as well. This commission uh, is, is helping the department take a look. So um, I, I think it's a resounding yes, uh, but, but it has to go as qualified. Uh, and finally, uh, the, um, uh, thank you for that informative uh, and illuminating <laughs> answer. Uh, uh, my, my understanding is that, that, that the Secretary uh, kind of assembled uh, for Fukushima uh, an inside-outside kind of technical SWAT team similar to the Gulf of Mexico thing. And I'd just be curious if you could say a little bit more about that and what its implications are for addressing uh, then safety issues. Um, he, he has formed... Uh, a, a, a loose group of folks from the national laboratories, uh, from DOE headquarters, uh, Bob Budnitz from, from Berkeley, Steve Aoki, uh, and others you may, may recall from your previous incarnation, and external, external as well. And as you might expect from Secretary Chu, uh, being the inquisitive uh, nuclear scientist or scientist that he is, uh, he wants people to just think out of the box. And he's invited our nuclear safety community to also work with them so that we can see what they're uh, developing and see what might be applicable to the Department of Energy. So it truly is, um, as he would say, almost like a Bell Labs uh, gathering of, of different uh, uh, expertise to, th to think about what are we not thinking about. For example, the infusion uh, yeah, of salt specific, water. Uh, specific outputs, specific um, as of right now, I do not know what the if there are going to be any specific outputs, but I do know that they are advising our nuclear safety uh, council. Uh, we've been invited to participate. Um, but I, I started to give you a, a single example uh, that I actually got from Secretary Chu himself early on, and that was the infusion of salt water. That went in, not as a criticism, but an observation what was going to happen to the mechanisms afterwards? Were everything going to work? Was there going to be corrosion? Was there going, 
you know, who's thinking about that? So like he did with the uh, Deepwater Horizon event, he brought in folks to advise and think not in the moment, but think longer term. And so that's what, the, what he's doing here, which is, uh, and, that, and they are advising, I, I believe, both the NRC and the Japanese. Thank you, Commissioner Moniz, and thank you, uh, Glenn, for that very artful answer uh, to that question. Uh, Commissioner Eisenhower, you have the last line of questioning. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much for this um, very informative presentation. Uh, you indicated, uh, of course, that uh, the department is uh, instructed by the secretary to undergo a self-critical review, and you have rightly uh, emphasized the importance of human resources at the Department of Energy, especially around these critical issues. Um, I, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about the training process. We've heard a lot about the analysis of safety events, but um, uh, what kind of uh, training are you putting people through at this particular stage, and will your training activities vary at all uh, based on the events in Japan? Uh, specifically, um, when we hire the people that we hire for the department, we hire them for their already ex uh, trained and experience that they have in both the private sector as well as other, other operations coming from the NRC. What we started, and you, and you may have heard me say that we're standing up a new training process and we're just just yesterday the uh, individual that accepted the job uh, uh, w w was in agreement so we're just in the middle of, of starting that up and identifying what needs to be done where the department is deficient and has been for a number of years is having uh, instead of county option and, and Commissioner Ayers, know, uh, Ayers knows this, is that we have a lot of training programs out at the sites for the workers, for subcontractors, uh, but they're not, they're not all under one umbrella to make sure that they're standard, standardized. So one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we have standardized training, that we make sure that we understand where we're deficient. We know the capabilities that we currently have on board uh, with our with our technical nuclear safety experts, but what we're trying to do is make sure that we continue them uh, being at the cutting edge. We hope that what we gain in knowledge from the Japanese experience will advise that effort as we build this. And remember, as I said, not, again, not being bureaucratic, but this is the first time that this agency has ever had an attempt to co exist all the training efforts in one location, more like a training czar. And it's my position that this, this entity should not report to me, but should report to the head of human capital. I'm not about, human, uh, I'm not about mergers and acquisitions, uh, so it's not about the typical build up your own organization. This is something that we want to do corporately. I realize it's a rather expansive uh, answer, but, but we're right at the early stages of what d more do we need to do that we haven't already done. All right. I saw Commissioner Moni's hand go up, so. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for your uh, kindness, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Glenn, I have one more, yeah, one more question, and, and it goes a little bit outside of your remit, uh, clearly, but, but it does have safety implications. And uh, this also may be a case, however, where uh, a response from the department later on might be merited. Uh, and it involves the question of commingling uh, defense and civilian waste. Uh, it strikes me uh, at this stage as there being at least two reasons to uh, reverse uh, the mingling uh, decision. Uh, one is that I think by the department's own statements, uh, we're probably a minimum of 20 years away from a civilian repository. Uh, since that decision was made, uh, there have been agreements with states uh, which would provide another 1998 a moment uh, when uh, there is no way to meet uh, an agreement. Uh, and so uh, moving uh, the defense waste out and perhaps therefore developing a separate uh, repository uh, which would have safety implications uh, would seem to make sense. Secondly, uh, in terms of reaching a civilian repository, there is a, an argument that, okay, we did WIP, uh, a next 
easiest meaningful step would in fact be a high-level waste defense repository older and colder, smaller amounts, no argument about whether it's an energy resource or a waste, it's a waste, uh, uh, et cetera, and that could provide valuable experience in a timely way then for, for subsequent civilian repositories. Any position or comment on, uh, on that? I'm going to go back to your earlier question and say yes. Uh, I, I would like to take that back to the department and come back to the commission with an answer because that will involve multiple program offices and while I have an opinion, I think the department needs to give you a more cogent answer as to what it's currently doing between EM, science, and NNSA. And uh, following uh, the chairman's uh, impatience, will that be an answer soon? Uh, yes. 